So today, what I want to do is to take a look at the idea of linear perspective. Again, these handouts that you can find on my website, um, either you either go to the event description for this workshop and you can print them down, uh, print them out from there. They're the ones called uh, the perspective grids. You can also go on my website to my store and the handouts from all my past classes are there as free items um, under, I think it's called workshop handouts. And you, there's a little drop down menu. You can pick perspective grids out of that. You then just kind of go through the checkout as if you were buying a free thing. And um, post checkout, it sends you a link. So you want to print this out um, and that will help you with today's class. Um, linear perspective is a useful tool for getting our drawings to look kind of like the reality around it, us. It's not exactly like the reality around us, um, especially as we kind of get into things more in our peripheral vision, and we'll be taking a look at that here. There's lots of weird distortion that happens. <clears throat> um, when you look through a camera lens, similarly, uh, similarly, depending on the type of camera lenses, there's different types of distortion. You've seen things distorted through a fisheye lens. Um, things are also distorted through telephoto lenses. Things are distorted through um, all sorts of, 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 of different lenses. And um, it's actually kind of fun. They're able to look at some paintings by Renaissance painters and figure out that they were actually doing their preliminary drawings through some um, sort of optical devices based on artifacts of proportion um, distortion in the perspective. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's kind of cool. So it's not perfect, but it's useful. It's useful. We, in most of my nature journaling classes on drawing depth, I haven't taught any linear perspective. And the reason is that linear perspective is useful when you are drawing objects with big flat sides and um, the bigger, you know, like if you're drawing a building with big flat sides, it's really useful. Very, very useful also if you're drawing things where the sides are at right angles to each other, right? And trying to get these shapes to represent on your piece of paper. It's interesting to look through medieval art um, before this was figured out. And there's just crazy stuff, kind of MC Escher style perspective weirdness going on in them. And then people during the Renaissance figured this thing out and they just had so much fun with it, just crazy geeked out on it. They geeked out on it so hard, they would even um, then paint buildings in ways where they played with the perspective to make it look like there were like additional rooms or the ceiling went up all sorts of extra levels. They made um, buildings um, that were designed to look larger because of distortions in perspective. You could play with the, 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 um, the distortion so that as you approached this building, um, it looked bigger and grander. Um, and, but of course, if you were standing on the steps of the building looking back, then the courtyard in front of you would seem really small. Um, but the reason I don't teach it that often is because there's not that many big square objects running around in nature, right? Um, the Borg have not really um, taken over um, planet Earth here. And so we don't have these cubes kind of mm, kind of going around in our environment. You're out there by the lake. A lot of this linear perspective stuff is not going to apply. Um, but there are places that it does, and we'll look at some of those. It's also very useful, though, if, there's, if, there's, if there is something with a straight side, um, if there's a cliff, if there is a fence, if there's a road, if there's a barn. Um, we will find human-made structures in nature, and sometimes you do find angular things um, in the natural environment, and that's where this comes in useful. So, but again, if you're just doing a landscape drawing, there's a tree over there, there's a squirrel over there, and there's some grass on a little hill, this sort of stuff is not going to be as, as important. There, 
in a subsequent class, we'll be looking at depth tricks that don't involve linear perspective. Um, but for now, um, let's take a look at this, just sort of remembering that it's very useful in sort of figuring out these cubes. So here's the basic observation. When I look at this from this angle, it looks square, right? That's square. All I have to do is hold it close to the screen and tilt it. And now this side is a lot larger than this side. See that? That's perspective distortion. The side that is closer to you, you see as bigger. The side that is further away from you, you see as smaller. Now let's notice another neat thing. On this grid, take a look at the angle of this. So here, this is parallel with the screen. When I tilt it to the side, notice how this line points up and this line down here now points down. So if I were to, let me get this a little bit closer so we get more of that, that a little bit more dramatically. I'm gonna line this up at the top. Notice how the one at the top is pointing up, the one at the bottom is pointing down. Now look at the lines in the, on the grid on the square and notice that those lines in the middle of the cube are horizontal, but they start to subtly kind of, as we go up the side, get more and more tilted up till we get to the top where it's really up at a steep angle. And we see the same thing going on at the bottom. Um, this, before people figured out linear perspective stuff, this was really hard to draw. Um, the basic idea here is that if you take, let's take this line here, and uh, we are going to extend it towards me here. So it goes up and up and up and up towards me. At some point, these two lines are coming together, I would say about at this point here. Right, so if I'm gonna actually use this, let's say roughly, uh, let's see, uh, kind of somewhere in here, right? So that line is coming down here. This line is coming up there. At some point, those cross. And it's gonna take longer, but these ones, this side is also sloping down. And this side here is, sloping up ever so slightly, right? And way off there, off screen, those two lines are going to converge. The idea of the sides of this converging, that's um, what artists call the point where they would converge, we call the vanishing point. And I'm now gonna kind of draw this on a piece of paper. Um, and here are some just sort of the, some useful thoughts on this. Um, I'm going to symbolize this on, on a piece of paper. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Can I still be heard clearly? Yes. All right, um, let's jump over to this cam. is we will focus. All right, there we go. Um, I'm going to start with a big horizontal line. All right, so here is a big horizontal line. Um, the general theory on this is that uh, remember, we had those two lines that were converging. I'm going to put that spot right here on the line. If I draw a line out from this and another line out from this, and I'm going to draw a little vertical one right here, I can get the same sort of a pattern where I have two lines that intersect and two sides that are angling down towards each other. Depending on the angle that I hold this, the, 
depending on the angle that I hold this here, um, these lines become steeper down when I tilt it like this, less steep here. So if my, what's called the vanishing point, I'm gonna put a VP here for vanishing point, is close to the object, these lines are really steep. If the vanishing point is further away from the object, say out here, um, those sides are not as steep. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw a little line here to this further away vanishing point. I'm gonna draw one here to this further away vanishing point. And what I get is a cube in perspective. Um, this line here is the horizon. And, oops, the horizon. And this is my vanishing point. This is my other vanishing point out here. Um, with these, I can construct all sorts of interesting things. For instance, if there's those little lines on this, all those lines, they all point towards the vanishing point. So if I wanted to get lines on the side of a cube, I could put lines on the side of my cube. And I could have those get progressively steeper. Um, this is a really useful way of representing these dynamics of three-dimensional space where these lines are all converging at some point way out here. This approach allows me to draft that onto my piece of paper. There are several different styles and techniques. So this is the kind of, just we're introducing this just to kind of give us some basic vocabulary here. Um, there's several different approaches to this, which we're gonna be investigating here. And uh, what we are gonna be taking a look at um, is um, perspective drawings with different arrangements of the vanishing points. So I was, I remember being, uh, seeing this in a book and being introduced to it and then playing around with it I started finding that I would make shapes that sometimes like this one would go like, okay, that's reasonable, I, I, I like that. But sometimes there would be these really, really weird shapes that I was getting and I couldn't really figure out why. There was sometimes this, this perspective approach, um, I got funky shapes. Well, we're gonna find out why that is right now. Um, we're going to start with your piece of paper that looks like this. If you look through the middle, that bold line is your horizon line. You can label it if you want to. This right in the middle is your vanishing point. And I have one vanishing point here on my piece of paper. And I am going to, to do what's called one point perspective. We're gonna look at one point, two point. There's also three point perspective, which we may get to by the end of this class. <clears throat> With one point perspective, I am looking at an object so that it is end on. One of the faces of the object is more or less at 90 degrees to my line of sight. So I am seeing this surface here as a square. Right angles. Um, but the side that is pointing away from me but there's gonna be one big side that is pointing away from me. So let's say I'm walking down a street, I'm looking down a street. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a typical place that one point perspective is, is used. If you're in an urban landscape where everything is put together on a grid, there are lots of big objects at right angles to each other. Um, you want to draw one of, let's say the street or these buildings. This is where this approach comes in. But I'm going to start just by drawing a cube. 
So over here, I'm drawing a cube so that it crosses over that vanishing point. Not a cube, I'm drawing a square. Whoa, really quick. All right, so there's the square. So there's the face of this thing. Now, one point perspective is the easiest kind of perspective to do, but as you're gonna see in a moment, there's some kind of weird distortions that kind of creep in, but it often is very, very useful. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, from this corner here, just follow back along one of these lines and follow down along another one of these lines to the same point and put in another vertical there. And here is my little cube. So it looks like I'm seeing this surface flat on, this surface I'm seeing at an angle. What if there was one down below us? Let's put one in here. All right, here is another one. I'm gonna draw a square. I'm gonna draw a rectangle over here. I'm going to put at, or sort of oriented at 90 degrees to this, just several shapes here of different sizes. On my page. And what you can do is do the same on your page. And it's kind of fun that you just sort of find what are the angles that kind of go to the corners of these. And you then draw your lines down. Now, this is kind of fun. Take a look at this one. See, I'm going to make one that's a little bit more clear. I'm going to do another one that is right over here. Yeah, there we go. Look at this. I can come back from this corner. I can come back from this corner. I can also come back from this corner. So here I'm actually seeing three sides of this. Here I'd see a little bit at the bottom. I am putting back here, getting a little bit of this side. You can see that having the grid already made for you makes this really fast and fun. I think I want to put some shadow on the bottom sides of these two. That would be fun to do. That's one point perspective. So you might imagine, um, well, here's this landscape with all of these <laughs> cubes floating around in it. Um, but how does this apply to other sorts of things that you've seen? Well, imagine that you are by a road and you are looking down that road past this big cube. That road recedes into the distance. Um, next to the road, there are fence posts. And as those fence posts recede into the distance, they're getting smaller and closer together. See what I'm doing is I'm just going two lines high so that the tops and the bottoms of them are keeping parallel with that. There's that line of fence posts. 
um, if there was a building beside the road here. Well, that we can turn this into um, a building beside the road. Um, you know, here's its door. Here's, here's kind of a fun trick. You want to find the middle of something, draw an X through that. Where that line comes in there, that's the middle of the building. So if this had a roof, It would be like that, and that roof then is going to like that. If I wanted to find the middle of <clears throat> this face of this building that is down here, if I wanted to put, say, a window right in the middle of it. But take a look, let's say we wanted, like, I mean, this, this trick with the X finds the middle of this. It also finds the middle of this. Isn't this cool? Look at that. So the middle of this is actually further down here. So if there's another door here, it would be over there. So that's just kind of a fun trick. Just again, you wanna find the middle of any rectangle, draw an X through that rectangle. You've just found the middle of it. If that rectangle is foreshortened, in any way, you can find the middle of it by drawing that X. That is where the middle of that foreshortened rectangle would be. So if this um, house had a door right in the middle, that door would be right there. There's a similar, similar kind of geometry trick that you can do. If I wanted to make sure that my fence posts were evenly spaced, as they go further into the distance here, they're going to be getting closer together. But how much closer together? See down here, I'm just kind of going like, eh, they're kind of close together, but not really paying attention to that. These ones are kind of progressively, get, but if you wanted to actually uh, construct that. Take a look at this. Here is an object. Oh, Jack, uh, could you please lower your page a bit? Ah, thank you. See, so I'm going to turn this page over and do this here. Here is an object. And here is another object of the same height next to it. If I want to put one more object over here at exactly the same distance, Right, um, you'd say, okay, measure this distance and put it over here. I'm actually not going to do that, and I'll show you why in just a minute. What I'm actually going to do is find the middle of this and draw a line through those two. So I made the letter H. Now, if I draw a line from this corner to this corner, that will be the same length as a line going from this corner down here, or from this corner to this corner. So if I extend that line down here, I now have a new line that is coming in at exactly that same distance. So if I put a line through the middle of something, um, what I can do is just use that construction trick to get a whole series of lines the same distance apart. Now that seems like a lot of fuss when I could just eyeball it, right? I could just kind of go like the next one should be about here, right? Um, or I could measure this, wouldn't that be easier? The reason that this kind of find the midline and go through the di diagonal of it is so crazy cool is look at this. Here is a telephone pole. Whoops, sorry about that, Vivian. Here's a telephone pole. And there's a whole row of telephone poles going into the distance. And I want to get these to be evenly spaced apart. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw in the next telephone pole. And look at this, so this line down here, I'm gonna just 
<clears throat> notice that the base here is on this little purple line. The top is going to be on this line here. So those are the two lines that I'm going to be paying attention to. The first thing I'm going to do is just draw in the location of the next pole. So I just eyeball it. I look at my telephone poles and say the next one is about at this distance here. So I'm going to draw it a little bit less thick and it's not as tall. So the next one, should I put it the same distance down and the next one same distance down? No, 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 I don't. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find the midpoint of this line, the middle of this line is going to be how tall is this? It's about, uh, oh, actually, let's make this easy for me. I'm going to make this whole pole four inches tall. So at two, that will be my midpoint. And I'm not going to do that. Right, so this is halfway that distance of that pole. I'm going to draw in this line here at that halfway point. So I've got my halfway point line going in. And look at this. Look at this craziness. I'm going to draw a line from this corner of this square through here. And I'm going to continue that straight down here. That's the position of my next pole. A little bit smaller. Now, what about this next one? I'm gonna go here. Line diagonally through here, continue that line straight. My next pole is here. You don't have to do this all the way down the line because eventually they get small and they get further apart. I mean, uh, closer together and they get, they get really small, hard to see. And so eventually you'll just kind of eyeball it in. But if I wanted to construct that, isn't that a kind of, a, a, that's a fun way of doing it. That little diagonal line through the center point and then project that down to those converging lines, you get a whole bunch of telephone poles going down in the distance. <coughs> you can see why urban sketchers are crazy about perspective. Because in an urban built environments, there's lots of things making these sort of parallel lines um, and they need to keep all of those oriented. Um, but unless you're sort of at that road and wanting to draw that road, um, you know, this, uh, this be, ends up being something that we don't see as often just in our straight up nature sketching. But that's the idea of one point perspective. Here's why one point perspective is a little bit funky though. All right, so essentially we're seeing part of this face of this thing and we're seeing the front here as a square, right? So you're seeing the front as a square. If I turn this so that you see a little bit of this, uh, this side here, notice that you're already seeing distortion in the shape of this. So if I do tilt this and this, I'm not looking at this wall straight on perpendicular, um, I am going to, um, I, I am going to see distortion in this other shape. So if there are a bunch of houses that are going into the distance, this and, and but I am looking and I'm looking straight on with those, um, you know, this is useful. And it works. Um, but you have to be 
edge on with whatever that object is. So you're looking at the, the face of it. The minute this object actually tilts a little bit, you're not seeing this, uh, you're, you're not really seeing this in a one point perspective. And that's where we get to two point perspective. So what I'm going to do here is at first, it just, it looks like this overwhelming spaghetti, right? Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a vertical. And I'm then going to follow one set of lines that goes towards one of these vanishing points in this direction, another vertical. And I'm going to do the same towards this other vanishing point, just following some of those lines on my piece of paper. If something is more in the center of these, so this one, notice that this side is receding more quickly because it's closer to this vanishing point. This line, these ones are receding more slowly because it's further away from this other vanishing point. An object that is right in the middle between those, if I make an object here, we're probably gonna see these two sides being uh, the same. So you notice how this one the angles which we're going off towards those vanishing points are similar because we're right between those. So I can put in a number of different shapes. I think it's fun to play with these perspective grids when you're first kind of just geeking out with this stuff. So notice like in this one, there's no line right here, but I see this line here, I see this line here. So I'm gonna just sort of eyeball it somewhere between here is where that one would go. So the sides of these objects are receding towards two different vanishing points. <clears throat> now, the next cube that I draw or the next rectilinear shape that I draw is going to look really distorted. It's going to look funky. And this is where um, I, was uh, something that often confused me about um, perspective drawings. Like, why was I getting like these weird shapes? Like this, these look legit. Okay, I can see that how this is, this is some sort of floating rectilinear shape, right? But I'm gonna make one close to the bottom of the page here and I'm gonna maybe right here. There I go. If I make one down this far, look at what I get. I'm following all my lines, but this one here has got this really extreme point pointing down here. Like this one looks like, okay, yeah, this is, but look at this. I'm following my lines right, but this is looking really funky to me. 
And the reason is that, um, oh, I, actually, um, the, the, the reason is that I am, um, the further I get up or down from these, the more these kind of, these sorts of distortions are going to start to happen in my perspective drawing. And so in this core area here, it's gonna work great. But the more that I come out here, you're going to see these kind of crazy distortions. Wooey, right? want that to be more of a vertical, sorry. The top end of it is looking more respectable. This bottom corner though is coming to this crazy pointed end. Um, so what's going on is that because my vanishing points are close together, the more quickly these weird effects are going to appear. Let me say that again, because this is something that I didn't understand for a long time. If my vanishing points are placed close together on the page, I am going to get weird distortions towards the top and the bottom of my page. And even when they're very close together, you know, it makes this, it makes the functional area of this picture increasingly small. So the solution to this is vanishing points that are further apart. So I'm now gonna pop over to this page and look at this. I'm gonna put a shape down here at the bottom. Look at that. You see how this one behaves much better than this one. Isn't that interesting? And all we did is we pushed those vanishing points further apart. Nobody ever told me that. And so the functional area of this one is this whole area in here. That is, that's, that's really useful. So you can do the same thing. I can put, you know, big, small, so you're coming from this side. So within the functional area, this is working well. But notice how, because I put these further out, it's working better. This sheet, the entire page is a functional area. And so anywhere on here that I want to make a shape, this one is going to feel like the edges, the corners of this are much closer right, 
at that one. So compare this shape with this one where you see a little bit of distortion. So very little distortion, little bit of distortion, lots of distortion. So that is, so a big lesson in this is that tight, tight vanishing points will make things really funky. Why did nobody ever tell me that? An arrangement of vanishing points that many artists find extremely useful is this. One vanishing point on the page, one vanishing point off the page. So for instance, if you are, um, you're an urban sketcher and you are visiting some town and you're sitting in your little, you know, sitting in the little cafe and you're, you're, you're looking out and the, uh, and you're looking across the street, down the street, you're looking down the street and then to your right, you're looking out across the line of buildings. This sort of arrangement where you're looking down the street here, just as you would be looking down the street in a one point perspective, we're going to take advantage of that here. And then we are going to um, use this off the page vanishing point for the face of the buildings kind of going um, along the other side of the street that is facing you. If it's not directly facing you, which most often it won't be, right? Think of all the directions that you could turn sort of to face towards an object. There's one point at which you're 90 degrees uh, to it. The rest of the time, you're a little bit more, a little bit less. So the time that you're gonna be perpendicular to that object is not gonna be that often. So this kind of a, an arrangement ends up being really useful. Um, so here is a, just sort of an imaginary street. Um, we're going to, uh, there's going to be some street that you're, you're looking down. And from that point, buildings are coming up to the corner. And then you're out looking along the rest of the street. This way. And on the other side of the street, we have other buildings that are coming up. So here's the faces of all these other buildings. Um, so we're looking down this street here. We've got this one, one here. So there's one vanishing point out here. There's another vanishing point that is off this screen. And so I'm just going to um, just do like, let's say the first building has a face that is this big. Here's the middle of that. Um, that means that the next building, its face will be about that big. The next building, its face is gonna be about that big. Okay. So, um, here is, uh, Where is the middle of this face up here? It's right there. That means if there are windows here, one is gonna be over here and one's gonna be over there. All right, so following this line here, it's gonna have its window here and the other one is gonna be over there. The next one here 
this same height door. Here's another building that is down here. Here is this face of this building. If this is roughly the middle of that, the next building will be somewhere in there. And if this is roughly the middle of that, the next building will be somewhere in there. the other side of the street. So you'll see this kind of a view a lot of places in uh, in, in, in urban sketching, a, a, a really useful visualization. Something that this doesn't take into account is that as, if I'm down here and I'm looking up at the building, this is, this is a really tall building. I actually am going to see a perspective distortion. The top edge of this building is actually going to look smaller than the side that's closer to me because it's way up there. So just sort of imagine that you're looking up at some building, you're looking up at that surface. The side that's further away from you is going to be smaller than the side that is closer to me. So this perspective view is ignoring that. This perspective view is ignoring that. And um, if the buildings are really tall, then that gets to be sort of something where, where we want to start kind of paying attention to those sorts of things. Um, and, and there is a way of kind of including that in what you do. However, um, if you're not in sort of a tall cityscape, um, you may not be running into that as, as so much of a problem. And um, this last one where you're sort of thinking about how would this side change? So you'll see that lots of very successful drawings are done with just two point perspective like this. They're not thinking about how much, how these things are gonna get smaller as they're kind of going up away from you. And the reason is three point perspective <laughs> gets really confusing. So here there is a vanishing point above your head. So I'm gonna turn this paper here like that, bring this up here. This is the vanishing point above your head. Notice to fit these all on the page here, I have, these are pretty close together. So that means I'm gonna have kind of a limited kind of functional area in here. Um, but the, but I wanted people to sort of to see how these lines kind of project from these, these different, th these distances. So I can have a box that is really tall. And as it goes away from me, I'm going to be seeing that getting smaller. As it goes away from me. And if 
that box. So I'll give myself a few kind of were to continue. Even up higher. You're going to see that distortion beginning to happen as we're getting up in here. So here's this corner. This one wants to point towards here. So we're going to come down like that. Wow. So here is this big thing. And I'm seeing it proceed. This is three point perspective. And you can see why a lot of people don't use it. <laughs> right? Like, ah, there's a lot going on here. Um, <clears throat> but this thinking about things receding towards vanishing points understanding that the closer that those vanishing points are to each other, the more distortion you're going to see. Um, we can see how this helps us kind of get something that kind of looks like the reality around us. Now, this is vanishing points in theory. And in this, we have been making up random shapes and placing them in space. What I recommend you do between now and the next time we meet is to create a bunch of random shapes floating around in space, All right? Um, and we're not yet worrying about it. There's that barn at that particular angle. And we're now, what we're, we're doing at the start is just messing around with things receding towards vanishing points. Um, so we're just, for now, just think about it. I'm going to construct some shapes with vanishing points, right? And I'm going to put these around in the shape sphere. And I'm just going to be noticing that there's kind of the useful area inside of these vanishing points. And once I get outside of that, yeah, not so much, right? I just want to be observing that. I want to be playing with it. And so printing out some of these sheets and just creating creating the Borg universe, um, it's fun. It's fun to just sort of play with these. And you also, to make it more fun for yourself, if you get yourself a little Tombow marker and can just sort of draw in some shadows on one side of the things, then they just look like, ooh, <laughs> you know, it's fun to do. Um, an another thing that you can do if you want kind of a cool effect on your shapes, so I'm going to jump over to the cam again. Um, if you have, you know, some shape drawn like this, um, there's kind of it. It looks kind of graphic and neat if the outside edge of this has a bold line all the way around. Then your drawing starts to look really kind of. You know, a lot of architects will do that just where you have kind of a hit line on the outside edge of things. 
And so if you do that, the thing kind of then starts to like, like look all kind of architectural cool, right? So you can have fun with this, but at this point, don't worry about that there is a particular barn out there. When we meet for our next class, um, what we're gonna be looking at is there's going to be a shape in front of us. And we're gonna look at that shape and then each shape, each time you turn the shape, the locations of its vanishing points are gonna shift. So where the vanishing points are is going to depend on how this cube is rotated relative to your viewpoint. And so we'll look at for that shape out there, how do I figure out, oh, that one would have a vanishing point here and the other vanishing point is gonna be off my paper. And um, if you, between now and then, have had a chance just to geek out with this stuff, it's going to be much, much smoother to take that next. So that's the next step, right? I want to look at that barn there and figure out how would I, if I want to show that, it's, it's not, see, when I, when I first was introduced to vanishing points and stuff, like I thought that I want to draw a barn and so I have to have vanishing points. I didn't get it that there is a specific location on the horizon where that vanishing point goes to make that angle on that barn. And that's what we'll be doing in the next class, right? So, but for now, just have fun with this stuff and play with it, right? And, um, and, I, and I think that you're gonna find that this then combined with the next one, yeah, we can do that. I hope that this was useful for you. I hope that this was fun. Um, print these out and mess around with them. And just remember when you get outside of those vanishing points, they don't work anymore. So if you're trying to do something up in this space up here, um, uh, uh, up here it's, it's going to get really distorted. Um, if, you know, for instance, on this side of the street, I can use this vanishing point, but because I have passed over where this one is, the vanishing points for these buildings is actually going to be over there somewhere. All right. So once I, this vanishing point is useful from here to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Once I get to here, that vanishing point, you don't, you can't have two vanishing points reaching in the same direction for your line. All right. So the closer you get to that point, the more you're getting like, <laughs> but I hope you have some fun with this. And thank you for being here. These workshops are supported by donations from viewers just like you. It's possible to make a donation to support me doing this. I greatly appreciate it. It makes a big, big difference to me and my family. Um, and if that doesn't work with your funding and finances right now, I wanna encourage you to keep coming, keep enjoying these workshops. They are, they are here for everybody and I want you here. But see if you can pay it forward in a different way with an act of kindness or stewardship. Uh, to nature somewhere in your area. An act of kindness, an act of stewardship makes a huge, huge difference. So just do something beautiful that you otherwise might not have done and keep coming to these classes. And I really look forward to seeing you here. Let's jump over to our community cam. Actually, first I have to check my lunch ticket. Lunch redeemed between noon and one. That's not going to work out for me. So you know what? <laughs> we can stay here as long as we want. <laughs> Lunch is over here at Omar. Um, so, but um, but I think isn't was, isn't I mean pers the, these perspective ideas are are interesting, and um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback, and take a look at some stuff that is going on in your journals. Um, Oopy doop. I'm now going over to the gallery view. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on this. 
um, and uh, uh, comments, thoughts, ideas, or page shares from um, anyone and everyone are welcome. All you have to do to share is hold your page up to the screen. And I know you've got something to share. You can also use the raise hands function. Um, and would love to hear from you. Hey there, Jack, good to see you. Um, I am going to add you to Spotlight. Jack, how are you doing my hey. friend? Good, um, I didn't do any Nate's journaling yesterday, so I don't have anything of that to share, but I did do my drawings for the infographic thing. Ooh, I would um, love to see it. So I did a leopard lily and a western swallowtail butterfly. Here is the western swallowtail butterfly. Oh, oh everybody, check this out. I love this, the saturation of colors um, and the symmetry. And you also drew this butterfly in the live position. Sometimes people will overspread the wings um, because they're drawing them the way that um, entomologists spread the wings on dead butterflies. But this has got the butterfly in life position and that saturation of the colors, uh, really lovely. That's and awesome. And here's, here's my leopard wing. Oh, Jack, what you're doing here with these curling petals is next level stuff. Um, tell us a little bit about your process in getting these petals to wrap and curl like that. Because this, like a lot of people just draw it straight from the side um, because this three quarter view with curling petals just boggles a lot of people's um, minds. So how did you go about constructing this? Um, I, think, I think it's pretty easy to like do the curling petals because you like start it going around here and then you end it and then like it connects to the same line. And then, oh. and then you do the, the other line down here. But okay. like, yep, yep, I, I'm seeing All this that. is one line. Yep, so that, that line on the edge that is closest to you is one continuous line. The one that wraps then around the far side, you're going to see it tuck under that line. That is, that's really useful. That's fun. Yeah, that was, it was really fun drawing that one. So those are the two ones I'm doing for the infographic. Hey, um, I'm going to bring Ann Chadwick on from Point Blue Conservation Science, um, who's part of the Point Blue team. Um, do you think we can use those? Absolutely. Those are fantastic. Yeah, I'm thinking so too. Yeah, really, really exciting. Really exciting. Love the vivid colors and, and the curves and the 3D perspective. Really great. So That's great. Thank you so much. We yes. Were, yeah. So yeah, Jack, we, we really appreciate um, you taking the time and doing the work to, um, to, to do this. That's really cool. Thanks. And as Iveo said at the start, we have a deadline coming up of September 19th, which is just three days from now. Um, but don't panic. I mean, just keep submitting and, and don't worry if somebody has already submitted something that you also want to do. We'll take multiple submissions of the same flora and fauna and um, we will use them. I mean, in all kinds of presentations and this is going to be terrific. Very excited about it. So, oh, and some people were asking about, uh, wondering about the perspective in the room that I'm in. Um, I actually am in a room that is a giant triangle with a little bit of the corners cut off. So I'm in a very weird, there's, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we, what have we got? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a six walled room. And so if you're trying to figure out the perspective and vanishing points in this room, um, it's, is it gonna mess with you? Hey, but you guys wanna see a one point perspective? See a one point perspective? Let's go take a look at one point perspective. Uh, 
Oh, almost. Can I speak loudly in there or speak in there? Um, uh, not, 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 not quite yet. All right, check that out. Yeah, so go ahead and, and follow. Where's your vanishing point, everybody? Um, oh, there's a, your vanishing point just walked by. So your vanishing point would be at the height of your eyes were you standing at the other end of that hallway. Isn't that cool? Yeah, so. Now I'm plugged in again. Yeah, it would be fun to teach a, a perspective class. I guess you can, if you've got enough powerful enough Wi-Fi. I could like run around and look at different perspectives. We'll, we tie that in another class. We'll see what happens, All right? Um, so now I'm gonna go over to my gallery view. Um, does anybody else have something to share? Um, Ivea and Ray Bonto. Let's jump to Ivea, then Ray Bonto. Um, boom, 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 and add spotlight. Hey there. Hey there. What's happening in your journal? Well, I've got more work to do on it, but I'm in process of making the willow um, for Anne's. So I'm thinking I might need to outline the sleeve a little bit. And I'm trying to find a good picture of the willow at the meadow so that I can draw the bigger one. Um, and my hope is that it will tie into Anne's landscape that she's working on. And that's a gall right in the middle of it. Oh, um, you've got gall. <laughs> so, so, <clears throat> so I'm working on that right now. Um, got a bit more work to do on that one. Um, recently had a fun kind of adventure going to Lobos Creek Valley. Although now, like now, every time I look at my drawings, I'm going to think, where's the vanishing point? So I wish I'd like, yeah, anyway. Um, well, well, again, on, on something like this, there isn't one because there aren't these um recta big rectilinear shapes in your environment true you've got hills and trees and so the rect the the, the vanning shooting point is relative to a rectilinear shape that's out there and so when those aren't in your environment you know like why have we been able to do landscapes all our lives without handling this perspective stuff it's because um, that's not where, it's, where we use it. So you're, you're in great shape. Okay, that's kind of, that's a, that's a relief. I had fun because I was trying to do like the plants that were a bit closer in the foreground and then the background. So that's something I got to work on a little bit, I think, making the foreground Ooh. pop, but I'm going to. This, no, this foreground is popping. So everybody check out the foreground with higher contrast. The yellows in the tops of that also help pop it towards you. The greater detail also pops that towards you. That's really, that's really effective. Thank you. And then, um, yeah, just fun with some other fun. Yeah. Why did the birdie cross the path to hide out in the bushes? I, it turns out I couldn't think of anything clever, just really honest about where the bird was going. And then I was, I was telling my friends that, um, that this particular plant, the convolvulus, reminds me of this one that we see in the garden called bindweed. I'm not sure if this one was native or not. And so my, and I said that they, we try to pull them out and they come back every spring and they, they um, mock our failure with their fabulous flowers. And so Mark says, dun, 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 you suck, as the plant singing out to us about our failures. Which is kind of fun. <laughs> and then for extra funsies, I've been trying to figure out how to do spider webs that are just like a mess. Um, we have what's called here a labyrinth or weaver. Oh, I love those. The little legs stick out. Um, it creates um, sort of a house, I guess you could say out of leaves of nearby plants. And it looks kind of weird. It looks like something spat it out, but really it's just a bunch of leaves in really odd positions. And um, what I learned that I didn't know before is that there's usually a thin but slightly more visible line of thread that comes out from there. And that even though the rest of it looks like a mess, there is this one catching web that looks neat and tidy. And I never knew that before. Yeah, there's an orb web in the middle of that mess. Yeah, these so are. I, I love these spiders. I love labyrinth spiders. Me too. And and so and so, what will happen is you'll get a critter in here that gets caught, and then um, our orb weaver here will just zip right down this thread, just like going down a highway, and then get it, 
find it and then drag it back to its layer of doom. And meanwhile, everything else looks all messy around here. And because I don't even know why, maybe it's because of where we live. And you can have these guys living in communities with all of them, like just making their various nests all close to each other instead of being far apart. Although each of them will have their very own catch web. So that was something new I learned. And then the only other thing is that now I'm going to have to try this perspective because I was all confused. Like the last time, um, this was like last summer when I was trying to do the, um, the sky study for the solstice, I was attempting to draw the buildings because that's where I live. And I was like, why is everything distorted? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, here's a, here's a building that is so tall that it was almost reaching my, you know, it almost looks directly up from where I was standing. And so I'm going to probably go back and play with these. And then of course the hard part, figuring out, I mean, it makes sense when I do the buildings, but then how do you deal with the street trees? So I'm not sure, but I'm going to play with that. How do you add street trees to drawings that have vanishing points? Oh, goodness. <laughs> so <clears throat> the... You, you want the, to, to, to really pay attention to the, the line on the bottom that connects the tree to the ground. So um, say on the, on, on this here, instead of telephone poles, mm -hmm. imagine those are trees and you, all, you want to get them all attaching on the ground at the same place. The upper edges, if they're all planted at the same time, will be roughly the same. But if not, they'll be all sorts of different heights. But this, the spacing and the bottom edge of those gives you those trees then attaching into the ground. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, and, and also, if you're in one place, you know, looking around and... Um, so you're looking down this street, then down that street over there, and there's a building and it's a different angle. Each one of those objects, again, that has, and that's what we'll be getting into the next class. Each one of those objects that's at a different angle has different vanishing points. So if there's a whole block and all the houses are parallel with each other, they will all have the same vanishing point. But the minute there's, you're looking at that block over there, it's going to be at a different angle. It's going to have its own vanishing points. So me in this room with six walls, each wall is at a different angle, actually. Is it? Is that one? At the, yeah, each wall in this room. You guys, this, yeah, it's, it, this is a really weird shaped room with irregular sized walls. I think each wall is at a slightly different angle here. And um, each wall would then have its own vanishing point. So yeah. since we can only see half of the room from where we're sitting, does that mean that we can, that we would be able to see sort of three vanishing points because we can only see just you and three walls? So yeah, right now that one behind me, you're kind of looking at it face on. So I would probably to make things easier, I would, you know, if, if I'm looking at it at a tilted angle, then it is gonna have its <laughs> have vanishing points. But I would probably make it simpler by thinking of that one just straight on. And then the, that wall, this wall here, it's coming to a vanishing point, vanish, vanishing points over here somewhere. That wall there is coming to vanishing point over here somewhere. Cool. That's really fun. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this, I'm, I'm in an odd size room. All right, um, uh, let's jump over to Ray Bonto. Gallery, Ray Bonto is, there you are. Uh, Ray Bonto, good to see you. Hey, what's happening in your journal? Hi, so this was, uh, I went crazy today. So this was, the two-point perspective. Yes. And, and look at the distortion. Isn't that cool? The distortion when you kind of get down to those lower ones, you really just start to see more of that, like, like whoa, that's just not feeling right. Um, and so it's fun on this to notice where we get the distortion and where we don't. <clears throat> um, one point two oh, fun. Yes. 
Look at the people. So all the people's heads at the same height. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, that, that um, I, I actually was, was sorry. What? Go on. Go, you well, go on. Okay, I, I was saying that um, along that kind of line of the people thing, today I was out at the beach and I was standing on a beach out here at Asilomar. And I, one of my things that's really fun to do when you are on a big flat surface and people are at different distances, um, I got to a place where I was close to the water's edge. So that meant everybody else that was close to the water's edge was at roughly the same height as I was. And so when you look down the beach at that angle, um, let me see here. I'm going to change, oh, I unplugged my camera. Um, you notice how all the heads are at the same angle on Ray Bonto's picture. I'm gonna add myself into the spotlight and I am going to bring this up. What you'll see is that the person who's close to, this is when you're looking out at the ocean, the horizon between sky and water, that's right at your eye level. And so a person who is walking down the beach towards me here, here they are. And, you know, the, there's the water list. A person who, way, way, way down the beach, head at the same height. And here's their body. Here's another person. So I was seeing this cool effect where all the heads are at the same height and all the feet are at different heights relative to, or there, person way down the beach there. And that's because if they're all standing, all of our eyes are at the level of the horizon. For all approximately the same height. If I were sitting on the sand, looking at these same people, here is the horizon. Then, and my head is at the height of this person's waist, I would see, I would see that person rising above the horizon. And the person who is farther away from me, I would also be, see their waist at the height of the horizon too. And so what you're seeing there is, Isn't that cool? Yeah, really. It, it's really weird. So adding people into a distant scene, just sort of say to yourself, what is the height of my, if they're all on this, let's say there's a big plaza out here. Here's this big flat plaza, right? And, right? and people are at dis, different distances there. Anytime I'm drawing a person on the plaza, all I have to do is put their waste through the middle of that line. So that the, the horizon intersects them at the same point. If I'm standing up, it's going to be at their head height. Here's the person even closer to me. Big fun. I'm sorry, yeah, um, I mean, you're, you're showing us some more stuff. Um, so, okay. That, you put a pen and that looked like some, this house looks sort of farmish, so I decided to put the farmer. Oh, I love it. Yes. That's why I put it. <laughs> yep, with the overalls. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, this is a three-point skyscraper, so 
oh, see, yeah, this is, this is what I want everybody to do. Just start playing around with it like this. Exactly like Ray Bonto is doing here. Just get these sheets and just start messing around with it. And your brain's gonna intuitively start to kind of, oh, I see what we're up to here. Exactly like this. Just get these sheets, mess with them, create shapes based on the existing vanishing points. Later on, we will figure out where vanishing points are for real objects. Hmm. Now, I decided to do some weird, weird things. Good. Um, with the vanishing point in the page and uh, no, the vanishing point, two point further out on the page. So I decided to draw some telescopes for some reason, but. Yes, yes. Oh, and look at the people, look at the people. This is cool. This is fun. Love it. Yeah, and so the, the tops of them, it, it really kind of feels like you're constructing shapes in space. That's fine. fine. Yeah, um, I went crazy with them. So uh, this is, I, I hope you have fun. I tried, draw, I tried to draw Sphinx, but it didn't work out very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for, for that, especially if you're looking at some reference material of the Sphinx, you'd want to first figure out where are that Sphinx, Sphinx's actual vanishing points. Oh, uh, bring that last page up again. Right. So notice um, the, the, the one that is in the what I'm seeing here as the bottom right hand corner, um, the one that is directly below the vanishing point. Notice that that one looks crazy distorted. It's distorted for two reasons. One is that it is um, close to the bottom of the page. And these are uh, vanishing points that are close together. The other really funky thing about it is that once it, um, once you pass that vanishing point, you can now no longer use the vanishing point on the other side of the page um, for um, figuring out your your angles. So remember, one vanishing point will no longer gets to play when you pass the other vanishing point. Um, so yeah, that, that, that positioning gets really, really confusing. Um, so yeah, just it's so useful one, to notice where we see the distortion, where we don't see the distortion. Yes. Yeah, with the one, one it stuck, at some point it started to get really funky. Um, and then the two, a little better and then it got worse. Yeah. And yeah, just, is, you know, yeah, you want to sort of pay attention to where is your effective zone for that distancing, that spacing of vanishing points. For vanishing points there, what are what is the area inside there where you're going to be able to make things work? Where does it not work? Oh, show us your block diagram. This looks exciting. To make this into an infographic that's all oh yeah oh this is a great idea i like how you're showing the um i like how you are showing the the stream also in a section view that your river on the bottom kind of cuts through there and you're seeing alongside it Yep. For, to make it into graphic. Yep. So what we're going to be doing, um, we'll be using um, one of these sort of block view things as sort of the background for all the rest of the things that we're putting in on the infographic. And so uh, what we'll be doing then is also using Photoshop to bring in, um, say, pictures of leopard lilies or pictures of swallowtail butterflies. And 
um, splicing all those things together to um, to 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 show what's going on in the mountain meadow, and you also want to think about how many of those principles that Ryan shared with us. Um, can you have something where you're kind of showing that in that infographic? <clears throat> that's that's really fun. Great to see. But I really like block diagrams. Um, and this perspective stuff, you know, you can also mess around with what would a block diagram in perspective look like? Um, so if you could excuse me for a minute. Absolutely. No problem. I'll go and open the door to find the vanishing point of my house so I can bring it over there to show you. <laughs> oh, okay. Are you bringing your computer with you? Uh, um, not along, but over there. <laughs> okay. You found a vanishing point? Okay. Yep, so when, when we're sort of squared up with the wall, yep, we're looking down, you kind of imagine when um, you're, you know, a line cutting from the corner of one doorway to the corner of the other doorway, right? And um, that, those lines point to the vanishing point, which would be at the height of the camera. So um, they'll be talking more about this next time we meet, but that horizon line is a projection of the height of your eye, or when you're looking through a camera, the height of the lens on that camera. That's cool. Yeah, so start, yeah, start looking for vanishing points. Start mm -hmm. trying to find like, what, where, do, where do I'm, in spaces that I'm sitting in, where am I seeing converging lines? What does that look like? I'm, I'm going to have to end this call shortly because other people are going to need to use this room soon. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And I am now going to just sort of bounce over to gallery view, see if there's anybody else that, uh wanted to share something and um i'm going to jump over to tracy and then i think we are going to have to wrap um because i need to make this room available for other people hey there tracy hello i have covid oh so, i'm so sorry um well here i am i'm past the major days so and I'm I'm doing okay I'm miserable I'm separated from people but tell, tell us about what your experience has been so far with that if you feel comfortable talking about that um sure I was already struggling with um, lupus flare-ups and a sinus infection so all of a sudden I just really felt much worse I was just laying down and I also got the uh vomiting bathroom stuff and then just was that in the bed that in the bed and I was like I think I need to go in I, th I think I'm getting worse I really didn't think I had COVID but you know first thing they do is they test you and I had it um in my state Illinois it was very hard to get the monoclonal antibody treatments and I ended up going to Wisconsin to get it and um have been doing moderately better I also think that on top of it, I have allergies and they're just sort of wrapping together. Um, maybe your wife has some advice as to, like now I'm, I'm actually on day 11. Um, so in theory, I'm not making the virus, but if you have a compromised immune system, I've read that you may not get over it as fast in terms of you're still um, contagious as well. And I've been like, should I get tested to see if I'm clear to, let things in our house loosen up or me stay isolated or, you know, just to get some advice. And I, I don't know. Um, no. <laughs> my Illinois doctors are, 
I mean, they just won't see you until you go to the emergency room once you're sick. Is pretty much how that's played out. Um, but my breathing, other than this nasal stuff, has been okay. And as long as my breathing's okay, I think I'm okay in terms of I'll just get better slowly. Um, and I'm not. And had had you been previously vaccinated? No, I had not. Yeah. Um, I really hope that that um, the, the the respiratory symptoms keep down and that we don't that you don't have any long term effects from that. Just how scary. Um, well, yeah. Tracy, we're all, uh, we're, we're all sending you our, our, our love and support. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, that sounds, sounds really, really, really rough. Um, um, if, if you want, I could set up a conference call between you and Sabelle. Um, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, I will be home this evening, probably pretty late. Um, but if you send me an email at johnmirlaws at gmail.com or johnmirlaws at johnmirlaws.com. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll set that up and um, you can just sort of have another, um, another doctor's perspective on it. And yeah. Uh, we can we will we'll, we'll set that up. I'm so so sorry to, to 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 hear that you had that you're experiencing this. Yeah, I I guess I've had a health challenged life really since I was about 18. So, um, it's kind of another rung in the ladder, I guess. Right. So, um, my thing has been sandhill cranes this whole summer. Um, I did this after a feather that I found. And then I, one day I was, they come very close on the road. I've walked within two, three feet of them because they just kind of hang out near us. We have a lot of ponds and lakes. And I noticed that one will raise its wings to protect its other friends and mate and children. So that's what I did here. Mm. Um, and on, on that feather, the part of the feather where I guess is that gel pen uh, yeah. right there on those sort of downy parts really just, um, it just adds a lightness to that, especially that against that dark background, really effective. Yes, thank you. I mean, all these techniques come from you and it's fun to put them into practice. Um, also, the cool thing I noticed was that the shaft starts out like clear and milky and then it it turns dark and by the end of the, at the tip it's a dark brown oh that's interesting And i really wanted to capture that detail yeah um and then the i wanted to get that rusty spot fading into the grays and browns D dark pigment in feathers is melanin which is a strengthening agent mm. and so very often uh so it makes sense that there would be some strengthening in that tip to give it more rigidity yeah um, and then I kind of want to watercolor this part, but I'm not sure how to handle this nest. It was a whole bunch of like reeds and sticks, which I captured in pencil, but I'm not sure how to do in watercolor. I'm thinking like the masking fluid, maybe. Masking fluid would be a great approach. Another way to think about that is to, um, as you're painting, emphasize the shadows. Take a look at whatever photograph reference you have and think about, I'm gonna put dark shadow shapes in and just draw the shadow, draw the shadow, draw the shadow, draw the shadow. Don't draw the sticks, draw the shadows of the sticks. Okay. And look for places where you see that, those, those shadows as sort of darker things and the shapes that they are. I would play with that. All right. Thank you and I'll, I'll send you an email. All right, um, I, we'll, we'll look for that. We'll set up a uh, call. We are, uh, the whole crew here is, um, is, is sending you our, our love and support. Um, and um, we uh, really hope that you feel better, better Thank soon. You. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to have to, um, pull this, this call 
to uh, close um, the, uh, but I want to thank everybody for being here and I hope that this workshop was really helpful to you. Um, thank you everybody for sharing. And also thank you, Tracy, for sharing about the experience you're having with this, this, this virus. That's sort of a, a reminder to all of us, um, especially with the Delta variant um, surging, that we all need to take care of ourselves, our families, and our communities. Um, and that the, you know, this is, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very real thing and it's scary. Tracy, our love and support is with you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Take care my friends. And I look forward to seeing you again. Um, I am probably going to be here um, next week. Oh, so next, um, Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm not teaching classes um, because I'm pretty sure I will be in a post-operative fog. Um, but uh, it is likely that I will be back um, to teach um, the next iteration of our perspective workshop um, on Thursday. So I really look forward to seeing all um, of you then. Dear friends, take care. Oh, thank you, Jack. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah.